when pop culture talks about AI, they generally have something like this in mind, some Terminator robot that might take over and kill us all. But what I want to talk to you about today are the invisible algorithms that are all over our lives, but that are not as glamorous as this robot, but that are, I think, more important. AI right now is being used to uh, manage our uh, electric systems, power systems, driving systems, trading. So sometimes you see the market going up, down, and up again, trying to figure out who to hire and who not to hire. And if you are interested in learning about how pervasive these um, data-driven algorithms are in our lives and the, uh, some of the unintended consequences that might come, because of that pervasiveness, I recommend that you read Weapons of Math Destruction or Automating Inequality. AI is also used in our government. So how many of you have heard of this 2016 ProPublica article that talked about a software that purports to predict someone's likelihood of committing a crime again? So how many of you have heard? So judges use this um, prediction as one of the inputs to decide how many years to sentence someone to prison for. I recently signed something, uh, a letter against something called the Extreme Vetting Initiative. And this was an initiative proposed by ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Um, ICE has been in the news lately. Um, and um, what they were proposing was to partner with tech companies to analyze someone's social network activity and um, to help them determine whether this person would be a good immigrant or not, whether this person is likely to commit a terrorist act or not, whether this person would be a good citizen. Now, I want to stop here and say there are two questions we can ask, right? The first one is whether or not we should have tools that are doing this in the first place. But the second question I want to address today is that the current AI tools, the automated tools that we have to do this task are not robust enough to be used in such high stakes scenarios. So let me give you an example. Um, a young Palestinian woke up one day and wrote good morning in Arabic on Facebook. And it got um, translated to attack them and to English. And Israeli authorities looked at the English translation. They didn't try to see what he wrote in Arabic. And they arrested him. They let her, uh, later let him go, but they arrested him. And so this um, idea of people not applying their critical thinking skills to algorithms, um, the way they would do to you and I, it's called automation bias. And for me, I think that the combination of automation bias with these systematic errors that we have in our tools is very dangerous. Um, Another tool that one might think being applied to social uh, analysis of social networks is, is word embeddings. So think of word embeddings as a space where words that are deemed to be similar to each other are closer in this space than words that are deemed to be um, different. So you can use these uh, word embeddings to train analogy detectors. And my colleague, um, Adam Kalai, and his collaborators recently showed that these analogies can, be, can encode societal biases. So I'll give you an example. So you have an analogy, man is to a brother as woman is to sister. Man is to king as woman is to queen. Man is to doctor as woman is to nurse. Why? See? So that's what it gives you, but this is, this is a societal bias. Man is to computer programmer as woman is to, gives us homemaker. So you might ask why, okay, so there are these biases in this thing called word embeddings, why should I care about this? Well, you can imagine an automated tool that's being used to analyze resumes, right? So let's say I'm a recruiter, I'm trying to find someone who's a computer programmer whose skills are close to someone in the computer programming skills. So I might see things like Java, Python, C++, and the resume, but I might also see that this person is a quarterback at the University of Vermont. This tells me this person is most likely to be a white male. And I might have a similar resume, exact same qualifications, but this person now is a softball team captain at Spelman College, which is an HBC, a historically black 
um, college so uh, for women, and so this person is most likely to be uh, a black female, softball captain, right? So now if I have this tool that's telling me that the distance of a, the black female to computer programming is much higher than the man, than the white male, then you're propagating these biases, right? So we're propagating biases in ways that we don't even understand right now. One other tool that I want to talk about that is, once again, heavily used in government and law enforcement is face recognition. So I encourage all of you to read the Perpetual Lineup Report, which talks about the fact that one in two American adults are in some face recognition database. One in two. And once again, we have two questions here. One is whether we should even have such a surveillance AI system in the first place. But the second thing I want to talk about is uh, whether or not the face recognition tools that we currently have are robust enough to be conducting such a surveillance um, in such high stakes scenarios. And my answer is no. So you all might have heard about the highly publicized Google Photos um, uh, classifying some black people as um, uh, gorillas. And my colleague, Joy Bolamini, and I had a paper talking about basically describing the fact that commercial gender classification systems have very high error rates for particularly women of darker skin tones. So what is a gender classification system? Think of it as, you know, I, it's a system, I show it an image, and it tells me the gender of the face um, in the image. Okay, I, still, I showed a, uh, an image of a face. And it just gives me a binary um, label, male, female. It doesn't handle any other types of identities at all. And even within this self-constrained, very, very constrained um, scenario, here you see, so I'm showing you the error rates as you go darker and darker in skin tone. So let's look at IBM, for example, for the lighter skinned um, group, you have an error rate of 5.1%. And then you get to 46.8%, which is almost random chance um, error rate. So our tools are not robust enough to be used in the manner that we're using them right now. We don't know what kinds of biases we're propagating because all of these little AI tools are being strung together and being used in very high stakes scenarios. So what are the solutions? I have all the answers. <laughs> I don't have any of the answers. Um, I have some ideas for some parts of the solution. So in my community, my research community, um, there are a lot of people, including me, who research technical solutions, so bake in some mathematical notion of fairness. But I want to say that before we even get there, we can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't ignore the fact that there are certain groups of people who are heavily policed. Who are the groups of people who might be adversely affected by these biases, by these surveillance practices? And who are the groups of people who are creating, involved in creating this technology and distributing it, right? They look like this. They don't look like the people who are being surveilled and heavily policed and adversely being impacted by this technology. Currently, we don't have any rules or regulations or standards to figure out what kind of tools you can use for which purpose. And I'm advocating for standards, laws, and documentation. So I want to close by saying a bunch of other industries have been here. AI is not the first one. So for example, I come from a hardware background, and I used to design circuits. And in circuits, we have something called a data sheet. So every component from as simple as a resistor to as complicated as a CPU comes with something called a data sheet that tells you standard recommended operating characteristics, disclaimers, et cetera. Anybody heard of a data sheet? No? OK. <laughs> um, and I'm advocating, we, I think we need to have data sheets for data sets and some of these automated tools that are being used in different places. We need to have information about recommended usage. For example, if you're going to use high uh, face recognition um, algorithms um, for high stakes scenarios, that needs to have a very different characteristic for some toy application. 
we need to have standards that describe this. And so my colleagues and I have written a paper flushing out this idea, and if you're interested in it, it's called Data Sheets for Datasets, and you can check it out. The second industry I want to talk about is something we all know about, the automobile industry, right? So when cars came on the road in the US, um, there were no stop signs or seat belts or driver's licenses or drunk driving laws or anything like this, right? And there were so many accidents. And even when seat belts were legislated in 1967, um, people didn't want to use them. So they had to have massive social campaigns trying to convince people to use seat belts. And there was this issue of bias, and there still exists this issue of bias in automobiles too, because some of you might know that car manufacturers were only testing their cars using crash dummies with prototypical male characteristics. So then you ended up with these cars that were disproportionately killing women and children, right? And it was very, very recently that the government mandated that they have to test their cars with um, crash dummies with prototypical female characteristics as well. Um, I'm talking about like late 90s when I say very recently. In fact, there was a court opinion in the 20s asking whether or not the automobile was inherently evil. And this reminds me of current conversations that are happening about AI, whether or not AI is inherently evil, are the robots going to kill us all, etc. So I find it very, very um, interesting and important to go back to history and look at other industries and draw some parallels. Finally, I'll, I'll close by talking about a very important industry, which is the healthcare industry. So some of you might know that um, clinical trials were not, were not um, legal in the United States. And there were also a lot of unethical drug experimentation that was being done on marginalized communities. So vulnerable people, people of color, uh, soldiers, prisoners, pregnant women, etc. And even once there was a procedure to have clinical trials, guess what? Once again, there was no law that mandated that in your clinical trial, you needed to have people of different groups um, before, to test your drug on different groups before you put it on the market, and that you needed to disaggregate all the results by these groups. And again, um, it was very, very recently that the United States government mandated that this had to be done for clinical trials. So now you have studies that show that eight out of the 10 drugs that were pulled out of circulation between 1997 and 2001 disproportionately affected women. It took many years for standards to be put in place in these industries, and we're still suffering from the biases that were propagated in these other industries. So we should learn from these other industries and not do the same exact thing with AI. We should have guardrails in place, and we should make sure that the group of people involved in creating the technology resemble the people who are using the technology. Thank you.